today's episode, we talk about developing yourself as a professional and how you do that both when uh, you're new to this game and new to coaching, as well as continuing that through and and being part of a football fraternity uh, of coaches. And we'll also look at development of offensive linemen and what what it takes for an offensive lineman to play at the college level. And discussing that with us today is the offensive line coach at Vanderbilt, Pete Rossimondo. Pete, it's great to have you here on the podcast. Hey, Keith, thanks for inviting me on. I really appreciate it. Pete, we're going to go back to the beginning of of your start in this. And you've been able to coach at uh, basically every level of college football, Division two, three, uh, FCS, FBS. And uh, you've learned a lot along the way, had some great mentors along the way. For you, going back to the beginning, though, what was it that made you want to be a college football coach and get into this profession? Yeah, you know, it's funny, Keith. I, I didn't even want to be a coach. Uh, I come up in a, in a um, you know, a very blue collar family. I wanted to be a, a physical therapist when I went to college. That's what I studied, uh, physical therapy. And I was with defensive linemen for most of my career in college. In my last year, they moved me over to offense. And I just meshed with a coach, a guy named David DiGuglielmo, who's been an NFL coach for the last 15 years. Um, I just meshed with him personality-wise. You know, he cha- the way he challenged me, uh, the way he taught me the game, the way I learned the game. And at the end of that season, he brought me in and said, uh, he just called me Rocco. He said, hey, Rocco, um, you know, you're going to be a coach. And I said, I'm not going to be a coach. I have no interest uh, at all. He says, no, you're going to be a coach. And Tony Sperano, who at the time was the offensive coordinator at Boston University, was getting the University of New Haven head coaching job. And he said, and Tony needs an offensive line coach. And you're going to go over there and talk to him. You're going to go in his office and talk to him. And I said, eh, I'm not sure I want it. He goes, nope, you're going to go do it. Do it for me. I said, okay. Uh, went over and talked to Coach Sperano, and he you know, gave me the lowdown of being a graduate assistant. And he said I would be the offensive line coach. I would be coaching the offensive line at the University of New Haven, which at the time was you know, top five Division II team in the country. Um, so a little intimidating. Uh, but, you know, Tony's a line coach, and I figured I'd have him to help mentor me and and, uh, you know, maybe help me through meeting, you know, how to prepare meetings, things of that nature. Um, so I'm still in college. Now I'm finishing my undergrad and I'm traveling back and forth to New Haven, Connecticut from Boston uh, three times a week because they have spring practice. So I got to be there to, to coach these guys while I'm still finishing my undergrad. Um, so it was a that was a, an interesting experience. Everybody in that room that I was coaching, all five starters, they were all older than I was. Uh, so it was a tremendous challenge to to, to create respect um, from those guys. Um, and the way the way I did it was make sure I was prepared, make sure I gave them good answers. And when I didn't have answers, I didn't give them an answer that that was the wrong answer. I said, no, let me check with Coach Sperano and see how that. And just and Coach Sperano didn't really mentor me. He just threw me in the room with those guys just to figure it out. You know, because um, he was coaching the quarterbacks and running the offense. So that, that's how I got my start in coaching. And um, it was a great opportunity. Now looking back on it, it was a tremendous opportunity. And it was a great opportunity to, you know, we won a lot of games. We had a lot of fun, met a lot of great people, and and really started to develop my philosophy in coaching through working with Coach Braun. Because you bring up something there, I think is, is is important to point out, especially for the young guys, but probably holds true throughout a career is that this is a very dynamic game. Um, I think you'll agree, you know, I, I coached for 27 years and not necessarily uh, actively coaching on someone's roster right now. I help out with some teams, but I continue to learn this game. And, you know, at, at no point in my career did I – ever put myself out there as the guru, the know-it-all, um, you know, there, there's an ego thing there. I think a lot of us want to be those things. And I, I think some of it's driven even more today by social media, but, you know, being okay with saying, you know, I don't know the answer to that. And I think this isn't really in any profession. I don't know that right now, uh, but I'll get back to you. You know, that I think is, is powerful in, you know, establishing trust because, 
you, you can fake your way through an answer only so many times before guys figure out like, yeah, this guy might not know what he's talking about. And if they get to that place, uh, th- you it's lose hard to trust. Build, yeah. It's hard to build trust. Yeah. You lose trust. And I, I think that, um, you know, the, the guy that I played for Dave de Guglielmo, everybody calls him Googe, but, um, Googe was, he was one of those guys. Like he was always prepared. He, he gave you all the answers that, that he knew. And then if you gave a, if you asked him a question where he didn't know the answer, he would always say, well, let me check with the boss and I'll get back to you. And I always, you know, I always thought that was great because I knew when he gave me the answer, it was the right answer. It was the answer that we needed to be successful. And I think as a coach, your job is to make your player successful. It's not to run your techniques or your system. It's, it's how can I get that player to be successful? And I think you have to change. You have to adapt. You have to, um, you know, be able to, and, and like you said, the, the, the learning aspect of coaching, it should never end. You should always be going to clinics, listen to people. Even if you go to spend an hour in a clinic and pick up one thing that can help your left guard become a better left guard, you've done your job. And that, that's really your job. You know, you can blame that player all you want, that he's not the player that he's supposed to be. And But really your job as a coach is to make that guy a better player. And, and maybe it's to change his technique and to tweak it a little bit so that that guy can have success. So that's really what coaching is all about. I think there's another important point there too in that, you know, when you join any staff uh, is to go in at first and, and listen, we all, all are, I mean, you know, the nature of what we do, we're always uh, enthusiastic about getting in and we're going to do this and that, but understanding, you know, where a team is, I think is important because you may have your, you know, things you believe in the techniques or the schemes or whatever it might be that have worked for you in the past. Uh, but you have to understand how you need to adjust and fit it to that particular group of guys that you're working with. And maybe, you know, you're not exactly where you need to be at that point. And I think that's a huge aspect, especially early in your career is to go in and, and listen again, not having to be that guru with all the answers, trying to impress everybody, but understanding where you're really at. And then going back to, like you said, the preparation of it. Right. And I think if you prepare long enough and hard enough, you will have most of the answers. If you have no answers, you're going to lose credibility. Sure. But if if you have if you have most of the answers and and there's just a couple of high level questions that that you need clarity on or you just want to make sure because it's going to have a big effect on the outcome of a scrimmage or or a game or or a play a specific play that was installed then then you go ask that question but you want to make sure you have most of the answers and that's all about preparation it's all about you know making sure that when you walk into a meeting you're prepared I think as you grow as a coach that's the thing you learn the most you you're you know there's never a a, a take a you know take a, a sigh of relief to me there's never a sigh of relief moment in coaching like I've made it right you know you're constantly working to get better constantly working to figure out a better way to get organized through technology or a better way to get information to your players or you know, those things never stop and the guys that stop you can tell right away like when you go to a clinic and you watch a guy that gave a clinic five years ago and it was the same clinic, that guy's in trouble. He, he may not last in the profession, you know, because things move and things change and you got to be ready to change and you not change to change, but you make sure you change to, like I said, to get your players better. That's the most important thing. Yeah, absolutely. That, that actually is, is an easier part of the job, right? To, to be able to study and say, okay, you know, here's what defenses are doing now. Here's how I need to adjust. Maybe here's a technique we need to develop a little bit more, et cetera. Uh, that's probably a lot easier than the other side is figuring out how do I develop the relationships with the guys in, in my room, with the coaching no staff, doubt. right? The, this is a relationship. This is a people-driven business. And yeah, there's a ton of uh, of the technical aspect to it. And I remember... Jim Jim Tressel, uh, when he first took over at Ohio State, he was at the Ohio Coaches Clinic, and he shared um, a, a quote from Albert Einstein. And uh, I might not get it 100% correct here, but you know, in, in the midst of your equations and diagrams, 
you know, don't forget at the heart of this is people, right? And that was a guy talking, you know, Einstein talking about science, but it certainly applies to football as well. And we can be the best at scheme. We might know the scheme better than anybody else, but that's going to fall flat if, if we don't have the relationships with the people in the room. The players make the plays come alive. I mean, that's, you know, that's what I think sometimes in the coaching profession that's missed, especially nowadays. I think in the old days, we knew that. I think nowadays, you know, sometimes you lose. It's not about what you know. It's about what they know. And it's about what they can execute. Um, we may love pin and pull, but we may have a right guard that can't get out there and block a guy in space so you don't run it. You know, I think those are those are all things that, that you have to consider in coaching. And the relationships with your players, to me, is always paramount. And they have to trust you. They have to, you know, there's a the, that saying that you I'm sure you've heard and you've probably said it a million times. Is, you know, they don't care what you know until they know you care. And that is, especially nowadays with this generation, that is the most important part. You know, I, I think some of the things that, that – that helped me develop relationships with players is we, they know the standard before we get into any, they know the philosophies. They know what the standard is every day and players want to know today. These guys, they want to know why are we doing this? Why is this happening? Why is that happening? You got to have answers. And when players know that you have answers and you have a standard that's set each day you go out there, you don't even have to – when you come off the practice field, they know whether they met that standard or not. And I think that's how it all starts, with relationship building. So, Coach, for you, you know, you, you've been at a number of places. Um, you know, the nature of our sport is there's always new people coming into our room. Uh, what, what do you do, you know, process-wise? How do you think about how you develop those relationships? What are some of the key points you make sure that you're always hitting on so that – those guys believe in you, trust in you, so they can go out and best do their jobs. Well, you gotta have. First of all, you gotta have some fun. You know, I think you know you got you got to be able to laugh. You got to be able to laugh at yourself. Um, the guys got to be able to cut on you a little bit. I mean, nothing disrespectful. You can't accept anything like that. But uh, and most of our guys are not like that. But you know, they have to they have to be able to have fun because old line play is hard and it hurts. And if they're not having any fun, it's it just, it's not a great existence, quite honestly. So we want, we want to make sure they're having fun in the meeting rooms, you know, when they come up, you know, I invite the guys over to the house for dinner and, little, you know, you can't do that now with COVID, but, you know, that's the way you develop relationships. You get them a chance to meet your family, uh, that you're not, you're more of a human being than you are a robot. You know, I've just been in situations where I've watched, meeting room just become tense and all about business and and you got to get the work done don't get me wrong you know we get the work done but you know we're not going to meet to meet and never believed in that respect their time they need to respect mine when it's time to meet we meet again all those things are laid out beforehand the players know and when they know what the expectations are it's a lot easier for them to live up to them whereas you start changing them every day or you, or your your mood goes up and down every day, you know. As a coach, you got to keep yourself in a specific spot every single day so that they know what to expect when they walk in the room. And and as you do that, they start to develop trust. And when they develop trust, you know, they get out there. To, and to me, they play harder. They know I can be demanding without being demeaning. If that makes sense to you, Keith. You know, I want to demand that these guys meet that standard. And I'm going to call them out when they don't, but I'm not going to be demeaning. I'm not going to, you know, I always say I coach the right guard. I don't coach, you know, Jimmy John, you know, I'm coaching the right guard, you know, and if I coach the right guard on a specific technique, I'm not taking a personal shot at Jimmy John. I'm coaching the right guard and every right guard should be listening, you know? So, so those are the ways I think you start to build relationships with guys and, and, you know, and, and I don't think everyone could be like that because maybe it's not in everyone's personality, but, you know, like our guys get birthday cards. You know, they get, you know, they, they if something goes wrong in their family, I'm calling their parents to make sure everything's okay. and That they the players know they have someone to talk to that, 
you know, has been through it maybe, or they've seen it happen with other players and, and maybe they just need, you know, somebody to talk to. So those are the ways that you develop relationships and, you know, guys are going to lay it on the line for you. Not, not because you're the smartest coach in the building. They're going to lay, lay it on the line because they love you. You know, in the same way I told them every day, they're going to get my best because I love them. And, and I need your best every day. You know, I've seen that dynamic and, and it's always easier with the guys who have been with you for a while because that relationship continues to grow over time. How do you approach the, the guys who are new, you know, maybe mid years coming in right now, or, you know, the, the freshmen who come in in the fall, you haven't spent necessarily a lot of time. You recruited them. It's a little bit different landscape now that they're, they're playing for you. Um, or maybe even some of those guys who are a little bit tougher, right? Everybody brings some kind of experience to the table. Maybe they haven't had that coach they've ever related to like that. Um, how do you get those relationships started with those guys who are, are new to you? Um, well, first of all, you check in. You know, I think that's the most important part um, as a coach is that you check in. Now, every time you talk to the guy, it can't be about, hey, the right, the inside zone to the right, you're comboing with the center. Here's where, hey, you, you know, you took the wrong thing. That can't be every time you have a conversation with them it can't be about football you got to be able to check in hey how's mom doing how's dad doing you know how's how's everything going with the girlfriend you know I think those are things kids appreciate that my my kids appreciate that I know that so I know that these players do so I think you got to check in with the younger guys they got to know that your door is always open um you know and and you know, once you get in it, and that's how you establish the trust and they know, hey, you're not just in it for, you know, because again, these kids are different than, than they were when I was playing. When I was playing, put your helmet on, shut your mouth. You're not, you're going to get one drink a, a, a practice and just go do your, they, they don't, it's not like that anymore. You know, it just, it's not like that. So you have to make sure that these guys understand that you have their best interest in mind. You know, and, and I think one of the key things is that the, you talk to these players about is I will never tell you something ever that's going to get you beat, that's going to make you get you hurt or not help you become the best player. If I'm telling you something, it's because I know it can make you better. So that those are those are some of the ways that you bring these younger guys along. And, and you know, they see the way you interact with the older guys, the older guys. When, when you establish that culture in the room, they take those guys under their wing. And and they say they talk about Coach Ross and you know hey this is how Coach Ross handles things and hey don't worry Coach Ross yelled at you but he loves you you know he does that to us all the time um, so that that's kind of how it how it starts to develop with the younger kids and getting those guys involved in that family. One thing that constantly comes up in in I think developing the relationship side but also developing yourself as a coach uh, constantly on this podcast is the idea of you got to be yourself and um, you know you've you've hinted at a lot of that as we've we've talked um but but going back to you know even the beginning but i think it goes through this profession as you continue through this this whole idea i mean you're as you go through you're you're going to get known for things you're going to have some accomplishments you're gonna maybe even get some honors for those things but beginning and end uh wherever you at are are at in your career i think you know, ultimately, if if you're going to be respected by your players, by people in the profession, um, it's about that idea of of being yourself. For you, how do you look at how that develops and and how you carry yourself through, you know, your career that way? Well, I think it all starts with your mentors and the people that have you know that you've learned from throughout the years. You know, my high school coach, still my biggest influence in in life. I grew up without a dad. He was my dad in so many ways and, you know, taught me about accountability, talking, talk, taught me about how to overcome adversity, how to overcome disappointment and, and continue to work the next day. And, you know, he always had a positive attitude. Um, you know, he was relentless when it came to doing things the right way. So when you have that at the start of your really that those are the formidable years. Um, you know, that, that's like, that's like unbelievable to have, you know, in, in your corner. And and I think it's all started with him. And, and then I went to college, played for a guy named Dan Allen, who, who passed away. Uh, actually, Dan's an Ohio guy too. 
Um, went to, I think he went to Wooster. That, that, no, no, Hanover, right? Hanover, is that right, Keith? Uh, yeah, so he's a Ohio guy. Went to went to Hanover. Um, you know, coach with Mark Duffner. You know, some re- some real good guy, but just just the ni- nicest human being you ever want to be around. Treated people with the utmost respect. Coaches, players, um, learned from. Then I then I went to work for Tony Sperano, and Tony is he teaches you about work ethic. You know, nobody ever beat Tony in the office. No one ever left after him at night. Um, detail-oriented guy, wanted you to be detailed with the players, uh, was, was, then I learned a lot from him. Then I, then I went to work for a guy named Barry Gallup, who, uh, Barry was, um, you know, great family man, always took care of his family, you know, really taught you how to be a great dad. Um, when, then I went to work for Bob Ford. Uh, Bob Ford is probably, uh, from a from a head coach's perspective, probably the best guy to ever learn from. Uh, understanding how to deal with staff, understanding how to deal with player issues, um, you know, not always worrying about the you know the red gumball I call it, you know that big gumball machine with that one red gumball in there. Just not always worrying about that red gumball. You know, I think that's one of the things I learned from Coach Ford and just treating people with respect and and. You know, treating everyone like they're going to have an effect on your career because at some point they will. Whether it be the guy, you know, vacuuming the rugs or cleaning the mirrors or whatever, or, you know, or the president of the university, you treat all those people the same way. I learned that from Bob. And I think that's how you start to develop your philosophy is you take all these pieces from these people and, and everything you get from them, you try to make it your own. You know, you don't try to do it the way they did it because I could never be Bob Ford. You know, I, him and I were just different. And I just had to make sure that I took the things from him and in my own way when I became a head coach to to be able to implement that with my players and my staff. And And I really learned a lot from those people. And that's how you start to form who you are as a coach is the people that have influenced you and the people that you've worked for. Um, you know, even your upbringing, you know, with your parents, you know, I've just, you know, I watched my mom raise four kids on her own with a high school diploma and, and, you know, never, ever, ever complained. And, you know, I think that's how it all starts. And then, you know, like I said, it continues on down the line. So those are my influences. And as guys come up through the profession, that's how you develop your philosophy. You know, I can't be Tony Sperano because I'm not Tony Sperano. But I can, you know, some of those things that now are ingrained in me, you know, that becomes the fabric of who I am. It's it's always a tough thing to do uh, early on. And that's, you know, we, we hear it again. I, I, we did a, a, a little segment um, a couple months ago with Ed Ogeron talking a, about exactly that, to be yourself. Um when you first step into it and you're trying to figure out who the heck am I as a coach, what, what would you recommend? What steps do you take to figure out exactly who you are to, to avoid that, you know, copy paste nature of, of how we do things right now um, to really, again, cause if you don't do it right, you know, you're probably fracturing trust or not developing those relationships. It's like you need to be any, any tips on, I guess, really getting to who you are and figuring that out. Well, I think the probably the most important thing that you can be um, is, is is to be is to be a good person. You know, number one in coaching is uh, be a re- be a really good person. You know, treat people with respect, and and they will treat you with respect in in kind. And I think if if they don't, then at least you know that that person maybe is not somebody you want to be around. But um, you know, I, I would just say when you, a lot of times you go to clinics and you want to listen, you want to know how to run the zone read. You want to know how to run, how to block inside zone. You want to know how to, what the technique is tackling to me, go, go listen to the head coaches, you know, and not just, not just um, Nick Saban. I'm talking about some of the the division three coaches that are, that are in the area or the, you know, the, the good high school coaches, go see them, go talk to them about philosophy and, what has helped make them successful and, and then just 
try to who you are and how you can implement that, you know, based on who you are, that that's kind of the way you grow. You know, I just remember going when I was younger, going in, in this profession, going to these um, practices and just standing with the O line and, and brighten things down. And then when the team came together and the head coach was talking, you know, I was over there, you know, on the sideline writing notes from what I learned in the, um, in the individual session. And to me, go listen to the head coach. You know, go listen to what that guy's saying and how he's trying to implement his program. And that's how you start to develop philosophies and who you are and who you want to be. Some of those things you like, some of those things you don't, you take them, you put them off to the side and you see how that, you know, starts to help you develop your, you know, your philosophies and, and who you are, your fabric, I guess you would call it. Yeah, definitely. I think you'd agree with this. Like there's a lot we can get from clinics. In fact, we're going to talk a little bit about the clinic you just did for Lawrence first and goal here. Uh, towards the end of the episode, but uh, I think that's a great place to get some knowledge. But if you really want to see a coach in action and learn some things, get to practices, whether that's, you know, spring ball practices, or if you're a high school coach and, you know, it's, uh, it's later in the season. I always liked doing this when I was a high school coach. If we didn't make the playoffs or we got knocked out of the playoffs, I was finding a practice to go to. Someone where I could just yeah. go and watch a guy you really start to see, you know, if they let you in their meeting rooms, what's this guy doing? Uh, you see the relationships mm-hmm. develop. You see how he talks to players, uh, how the players respond to them. You see good things. You see bad things. And I- I've got notebooks full of that you know, sitting in a box somewhere in my garage. But right. but mm-hmm. that's where you really start to learn those things. You see those guys uh, do, actually doing it out on the field. Clinic talks are great. You're going to get a great foundation of knowledge all the things you need to learn, but you have to, I think if you're going to develop in this profession, you have to be able to see outside of, you know, yourself and your coaching staff sometimes too, uh, to really see the potential in, in how you can do this. So when I was an assistant coach, um, and I would go to a clinic or I would go to, um, let's say we went to university of Kentucky and we spent four days there with the staff, right? Like I did when I was at, um, Northeastern. Um, I used to write up, do you know, do a write up of everything I took notes on, and I would give the write up to the head coach, but I would also give it to the coordinators and ask for feedback. You know, on how did, did I get, did you get the information the way I received it? You know, is 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 it complete? Is it in a in a chronological order? I just always wanted feedback from people and some, and some coaches didn't give you feedback. You know, you give it to them, they probably toss it on the desk. But when I worked for Bob Ford, he would take, he wouldn't like jot notes down on the, on the thing I'd give him and he'd give it back to me, make a copy of it and give it back to me. And um, I always thought that was beneficial for me, you know, cause again, that, that tells you that you're, you're ta- you are taking the right notes, you know, you are, and you do it, you give it to a, a, a guy who's maybe been around a little bit longer that, you know, quite honestly, when I was a head coach and guys would give it to me, I learned some things about how guys take notes. And, you know, I'm like, wow, that's that's pretty good. I I, I need to use that. <laughs> and and you, you're just always learning. You're constantly learning. You can learn from people that are inferior to you as far as level of, you know, where you are on the coaching tree. And, you know, you, you can never stop learning. You know, and I think the guys that stop learning, you can just, like I said, you can tell who stopped learning, you know, and who's just, who's coasting. Coach, I think those are are some great recommendations. Flipping gears here to kind of a different topic. Uh, And I think something really affecting us in a different way right now as we are in what seems like an endless dead period. Uh, You're you're not able to get guys on campus. Uh, You're not able to see guys uh, play live, et cetera. Um, we're relying on some of the measurables right now, but you know, the recruiting aspect of this, you know, especially related to the offensive line, what are you looking for right now? And, and how do you feel guys best get exposure during this, this COVID shutdown? Well, the guys that are playing, you know, those guys don't really have any issues because they have film. And, you know, I think, for those guys, a lot of times we're just looking for maybe a video from the coach on players' height, weight, 
um, you know, wingspan, hand size, you know, from a lineman standpoint. That's kind of what we look for now because we can't stand next to him and shake his hand and, you know, get a chance to, uh, you know, to size him up, so to speak. So I think those are ways to get that information to the coaches. I think the other things, like if I'm watching a film, like it's easy to tell. Like we want guys that are going to use their hands. We want guys that have good bend. We want guys that finish plays. Like if I watch an old lineman's highlight film and I like it, I immediately go to the game film because then I want to watch him play to play. So if you're a young coach and, and you got you're a high school guy and you got offensive linemen, they better they better play play to play because that's what I'm going to go watch. And 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 good coaches are going to do that. They're going to go watch a lineman play play to play. You know how do you overcome it when you miss a a reach block and a guy makes a tackle or you get beat for a sack? How do you come back the next play? I think all those things that grit. You know that's the way you determine that grit that we really you know you need at this level and. You know, I think those are some ways to, um, you know, if you're looking to get uh, on a radar, that's how that's how you're looking to get on a, a Power 5 radar. The other thing, if you're not playing, I think it's always good to show videos of football movements, um, you know, maybe even like pushing sleds, um, you know, using medicine balls to, to drive guys off the ball, um, you know, working one-on-ones against other guys. You know, I think those are just ways you can get information to coaches, information that they need uh, to make decisions on whether they think a guy can, you know, help them win or, you know, be a good part of their room. And then, you know, get on the phone and, and Zoom calls. We don't, I can't tell you how many Zoom calls I've done with recruits, but they're so beneficial because you get a chance to go, get face-to-face, to talk to them, get to learn a little bit more about them, learn about their families, you know, because they're in their houses. You get to see their houses, how they interact with their families, how they interact with their, you know, their siblings, those things are really important, you know, when you're making decisions at this level about bringing a guy in your program. You know, again, looking at um, not having the camp aspect of this, right? Uh, yeah. You know, in, in camp, would you, you know, things you get to see, I mean, is this guy really flexible? Can he bend, right? How does he look in this drill? Um how does he handle himself? You know, I, I'd always look in the drill, like especially the competitive ones. You know, when I was recruiting, uh, if he didn't win the drill, what, what did he look like in line, right? Is it the guy, what was his body yeah. language like? Like those things, you don't get to see those no things now um, as a coach. What's your approach, I guess, to, to figuring those things out that you don't have the, the same mode of, of being able to, to see those things as before? Well, you know, again, I, I'm a I'm a people person. I'm a guy that wants to get to know people, and I think as you get to know people, and you know, I'm not a I'm not what would they would call a hard sell recruiter. You know, I'm not just going to tell a kid what he wants to hear to get him. You know, I'm going to, of course, you know, accentuate the positives of Vanderbilt, but you know, the most important thing for me is to be honest with him so he understands what he's getting himself into, and. um I think as you get to know people, you get to understand how they overcome. And you got to ask the right question. You know, is football important to you? You know, what are you doing this weekend? If something that weekend has nothing to do with with getting better as a football player at this point in his life, do you really want that guy on your team? You know, those are some things that you you got. You know, some little tidbits that you find out when you get to know people. You know, if if you talk to a guy and say, "Hey, what'd you do? What'd you do this weekend?" He, he just starts talking about, hey, I did this, I did that, I went, you know, I, w- I went skiing, I did this, and there's not one thing about, hey, I trained and I I, I got with my my uh, O line coach and we worked on some drills, and like then, then you're in trouble if you if you're not getting that guy at this level, you know, maybe that guy can make it at, at Division two level or to three level, but I've coached at those levels too, and man, you better have competitors there too, because every every level of football is competitive. You know, I, I, you know, I talked to some young guy and they said, well, I think I can go here and play right away. And I said, well, <laughs> I'm not so sure about that. You know, they got seniors, they got men that are playing out there, you know, guys that are 22, 23 years old, you're not even shaving yet. What do you mean you can go there and you could start right away? You know, I mean, I, I just try to keep it real with guys because when they get here, I don't want them it, it to be a shock. 
you know, to hear the truth. You know, and, and maybe that's not going to be popular, but, man, do you want guys that you got to lie to to get to your campus? I don't want those guys. Coach, recently you uh, were part of Lawrence First and Gold Clinic to benefit pediatric brain tumor research and cancer services, uh, an incredible event. Uh, I was blown away by uh, just the guys who wanted to get involved in this. And, and John Luce and I, as, as we put together that clinic lineup, found ourselves having to turn away great coaches who you know, wanted to give their time if we had a spot. But you were there and presented on offensive line techniques and fundamentals, and that uh, will be available as a course on Coach to begin the, the proceeds from that to benefit Lawrence First and Gold Foundation as well. Uh, for those of those those in the audience who didn't attend, uh, what what did you put into that course, and could you give us an overview? Well, I, again, I always whenever I went to a clinic, that, you know, scheme is great, but we're going to run our scheme, you know. So I, I wanted to make sure that I was going to give them some techniques and some tidbits that they could bring to their individual sessions and bring to their group, and and hopefully again give them a tool in their toolbox to help that left guard become a better left guard. You know, maybe it's something that they don't, they don't do normally, but maybe it's something, Hey, this guy's not able to get leverage. Well, maybe coach Rosamondo's drill can help me help this guy gain leverage on these outside zone plays, you know, things like that. And that's what I, I always wanted that little tidbit. I always wanted that, that information to help me make my players better. So that was really what we did it for. And, and, you know, Lauren's, first and goal is an incredible cause. John Luce is an incredible man. I know him for a long time. We're both Albany guys. Um, So I know John, I've been doing the camp ever since it started. And with COVID, we can't do the camp. So all the guys wanted to jump in and help John and Lauren. Um, And it's it's just a great cause. And as John said, that money goes directly to families. You know, it goes directly to help families who are dealing with you know, whether it be, um, you know, location things that they got out and need hotels or, you know, transportation or, you know, and I think, just think that's an unbelievable cause. And, you know, if you can do that and you can get to that camp or you can do that clinic or you can jump online and, and get in and, and, you know, get in that clinic. And I think it's just a great cause. And I, I appreciate you guys having me out there, and, you know, being able to do that for, for John and for Lauren and, um, hopefully we just continue to do that and continue to help raise money and, you know, keep the dream alive for everybody. Absolutely. Well, for, for our listeners out there, you can find the link to uh, coaches course on O-line fundamentals and techniques in the show notes, which you can find in the description on whatever app you're using, or you can go to coachingcoordinator.com and find this episode in, in the links to that there on coach tube uh, coach final question for you. You know, when you look at all the things you do, and you've you mentioned some great stuff here today, uh, but all you do as a coach, what is the one thing you'd really point to that gives your guys the winning edge? Uh, again, I, I really believe in relationships and developing relationships and making sure that my players know that I love them. Um, and then I'm going to put it on the line for them every day. And everything I do is for them. And to make them better players, make them better human beings, get them ready for life after football, whether it be after the NFL or, um, you know, after college as they as they start to embark on their careers and becoming family men and becoming members of communities. Though, to me, to help them to become better at those things is, I think, the way that I develop relationships with our players because they know it's real. They know it's it's really in their best interest. And, you know, like I said, demanding, not demeaning. And what I mean by that is like, I had a left tackle here who's probably one of the best players I've ever coached uh, from a talent standpoint. And he'd probably be a draft pick here in the next couple of years. And I watched the practice. He had 14 loafs on the practice. Now I could have went into the meeting room, blasted him in front of his peers. You know, what are you doing? I, instead, I clipped them all out, called them into my office, we sat down, we watched the clips without any, anything verbal back and forth. I just said, let's just watch every one of these clips. And then when I turned it off and I said, well, what do you think? And he said, I'm disappointed in myself. I said, well, I didn't want to, I didn't want to um, embarrass you in front of your, 
your teammates. It's the first time this ever happened. I said, if it happens again, I'm not going to be able to hold my tongue. But, you know, those are the ways you develop trust. Now he knows, right? He knows that I, that he, that I, I have his best interest at heart. Now, next time I may not be that kind, but at least he knows that I have his best interest at heart. And I, I think that when you can develop relationships with players and they can play for you, they, they, they actually play six, seven, eight times better maybe than their talent level. If, if they're able to do that. And I think O-line is a very unique position because it maybe is the only position that, that the sum is greater than the parts, you know, and, you know, we, we really work on being a unit, playing together, caring for each other. And as you get with our guys longer and longer, you, you realize that it really is a tight knit group. They eat together, they go out together, they hang out together and it becomes a, a like a family. And, how do I know that? Well, the guy that trained my son in New Jersey, his name is Gear Goodmanson. He's at a place called Test, right? I coached him in 2002 at the University of Albany, and he worked my son out in New Jersey. And why, why did he do that? For free. Why did he do that? Because he loves Coach Ross, you know, and, and he still talks to all the other guys that we played, that he played with. Those are the kind of relationships as a coach I want to build, you know, and I want to make sure that, that our players have a great experience. And I think that makes me somewhat unique. You know, I'd like to think that that's what makes a great coach is, is to not only be a great X's and O's guy and be able to give the answers that way, but to also help them become a better human being when the football is over. And, you know, from what I've seen from my guys, we be, they become better human beings and, um, so that, that's really what my goals are. And the reason we get into this profession is not, you know, it, I know nowadays it's about the money and the money's good, but really it's about people. It's about kids. It's about developing young people and making sure that they're ready for life. Not, Hey, this guy can't play. I'm going to cast him off. You know, you just, that, that's not what we're in it for. You know I mean? So that's a little bit about me. Coach, I appreciate everything you shared with us today. Uh, if our listeners want to connect with you, what's the best way to do that? Uh, probably email, uh, you know, peter.c.rosamondo at vanderbilt.edu. Um, that's probably the best way to get in touch with me. Coach, really appreciate your time today. Again, appreciate what you did uh, for Lawrence First and Goal and participating in that and Best of luck to you and your team in 2021. Thanks, Keith. Appreciate it. Thank you again for listening to the Coaching Coordinator Podcast. Please, if you are enjoying the podcast, head over to iTunes or Spotify and click five-star for a rate. If you have a minute, write a review. It really helps the podcast. Check out our new home for the Coaching Coordinator Podcast. That's at coachandcoordinator.com. And follow me on Twitter at Coach K. Grabowski.